Ah, il est passé oh sur la oh super oh l'artiste Super oh Encore un but sensationnel Hello everyone and welcome to the final podcast of our coverage of the Women's IHF World Championship. France come out with a goal that we never doubted them at any point. Did we? No. Uh, <laughs> it's Chris O'Reilly here, joined by Alex Kulesh. Hello, Alex. How are you, Chris? And Brian Cabian. Hello, boys. Today on the podcast, we're going to go through the final day of action, our final words on the championship. And of course, no end of tournament would be complete without our unofficial alternative awards. And uh, we'll be going through that as well in this podcast. But before we move on to that business, uh, a thank you to everyone who's supported us throughout the championship on Patreon and uh, time to shout out some of our new patrons as well who've jumped on board right for the uh, the last few days. So thank you to uh, Leon Militia, to Anne-Sophie Axelson, Esther Mukuta, Ada Steinus and Victor Schalberg, as well as all of the rest of you. And uh, a great time, as we said, throughout the month to join because we'll also have plenty more coming up in January with the men's EHF Euro. Should we start with the gold medal game? France are world champions, Chris. France are world if champions. If, I, I think if Sweden won the world championship, you'd have a more excited <laughs> reaction. No, true. I mean, You're just going through familiarities. Yeah, it's, France it's, are world champions. And <laughs> France and Norway have won 13 of the last 17 major championship goals since the year 2010. It's it's difficult to get excited about it. I know it it is not a great. It was an interesting final. You didn't think it was a great final. I, I think you when you compare it to the semi final, I, I know where you're coming from. It's not. It wasn't as the same, the same level of excitement to one of the best games we probably have ever seen. To it was a good. Yeah. It was a good final. It was it was a solid final. I think when it's when it's missing a little bit of drama in the last few minutes, and that's my big takeaway from this. That maybe gets in the way of it a little bit. Drama not enough that Lena Granvaux, a 20-year-old <laughs> French player who got put out onto the right back after Laura Fleep had the flu, which uh, Paul Bray mentioned once or twice in the commentary, if anyone caught that. Uh, and two goals in it with three minutes to go. France broke down, no nothing going. This 20-year-old starlet gets the ball and chucks it into the top corner, essentially winning the game. Maybe it wasn't the last second. No, but, no, no. You know, we're no, still no, no, it the was game great. being well, decided. So, no, we're, 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 <laughs> as, as, two as, 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 as neutrals, I think we're victims of love and chaos. And what Lena did is was she kind of restored order of things. And if you're from a, from a French perspective, if you go onto any of the French websites and look at all the comments, they're all talking about her. All the fans are are raving about her performance in the final. And that just kind of restored order in the final. And it was incredible for what that was. And from a French perspective, it was it was, it was was mind-blowing that she just came out of nowhere and did that. But for us damn neutrals who just want to see the world burn and people fall all over the place and red cards and false substitutions and absolute chaos. Last second goals. Last second goals and crazy stuff happening. It didn't quite have the same thing as maybe the, the, uh, the Norway-Denmark game had. What I've fallen foul of here is that I wanted to really uh, wax lyrical on Lena Granveur in the awards because I have her down for one of the awards, uh, which I think we'll all have her down for this specific award. Uh, so should we just give out the breakout award now? I mean, Lena Granveur coming into this championship with six caps and five goals to her name internationally, five goals in that final, and four of them were France's last four goals. I mean, that is absolutely astonishing she turns 21 next month scored 20 goals in the championship Alex you'll love this the assist to turnover ratios for a playmaker turn right back 10 to 6 so she's very nicely there and 9 penalties earned as well uh, which is uh, an underrated uh, because it's generally non-existent until now stat I think it's probably the best 
breakout award because it literally was a breakout award because no one saw it coming. So I think it's it's fitting to the title. And it, it, there weren't easy goals either. Some of them, some one of those standing shots was absolutely incredible. I mean, it was just so well placed. It was it was uh, some great confidence to pull to, to even attempt some of those shots. And uh, yeah, she surprised everyone. I really enjoyed the final. I, I'm I'm surprised by the very enjoyable final. Yes, there just wasn't any like drama. It was just it was too good. Is that is that possible? It was too like too high class from France. I mean, Norway were a disaster with 18 turnovers, which kind of cost them the game in one way in the end. But France were just like, yeah, you can't argue with it. And that's we're just we're just absolute, you know. We're 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 a scoreline journalist, Alex. <laughs> Absolute scoreline journalism going on here. That first half was one of the best games of handball, first halves of handball I've ever seen. The maybe the defenses weren't as uh, um, strong as we've seen in, in other games, but the offensive talent was incredible. And France scoring twenty goals in one half was absolutely wild. Um, it's funny because they were really tearing about it's funny because we always talk about goalkeepers at this stage of the tournament and I felt like none of the goalkeepers for the final I mean there was some good saves and some important saves but we didn't have that goalkeeping performance that maybe we, we were, we've gotten used to in finals at this level uh, which was interesting which I think resulted in a lot of the, the high scoring but we saw in that second half basically the script that Norway have always gone through You know, they're down in the first half in big games. Everyone is playing well, but not not, not winning. They knew that they're going to come back. France knew that they're going to come back. And Norway did come back. And it was uh, Katrina Lunda coming in. And while she didn't finish the half strong, it was that moment of, I think at one stage, she had eight saves from 17 shots. So she is up above 40 percent and it was 20 then it got to 26 25 norway and that's when it was like okay this is this is the game we're all used to and then france was just too good and they found another gear through a 20 year old starlet which is uh it is great it and it, and it is different in that sense from the uh, well, it's not actually different from the last final because uh, Norway won the last final because of a uh, a young 22-year-old starlet by the name of Henny Reister who took over in the second half, literally took over in the second half. So, yeah, as, um, as one of our uh, witty fans on Discord said, is Grand Vue French for Reister. Uh, that is the... Uh, I'll have to go and find the... Uh, who it was to give them credit for it, but yeah, okay. Like, don't don't get us wrong here, Alex. It's just because we're not like, oh my god, last second goal doesn't mean we didn't enjoy the game. All right, <laughs> it was a fantastic. Game. And that first half, I mean, you mentioned you both mentioned the scores there, thirty-seven goals in the first half. You would have maybe expected thirty-seven goals in the entire game, based on these teams' history. And uh, that was that was wonderful to see both teams like showed their counter-attacking best, really thro- like absolutely hammering each other as well. A little bit like an old-school Norway-Netherlands game, uh, but even better. And uh, France showing they can, uh, they can beat you in many different ways. What really resulted in, in France winning? Do you think it's that they were too good, or was it Norway that really just shit the bed with 18 turnovers? Well... <laughs> What do you think? I'll just give the uh, the credit. There's uh, Jan Willem who said Grand Vue is French for Rice that. Yeah, for, for me it was the turnovers, but not just the... the t- it wasn't turnovers in, in the case of just Norway throwing the ball away. They were put in really awkward situations by France. The French defence came flying off the line over and over again and, and forced those turnovers at times. Some of them were just poor passes out like over the sideline, but there were a fair few occasions there when... Oftedal, when Reista and Merck, responsible for 14 of those 18 together, uh, were looking for the option they thought was the obvious one or the, the one to get them out of trouble. And uh, French players stole the ball. So I mean, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And it shows that France really did their homework there. It showed that Norway were 
short of options. And we talked about this. Were they going to throw on the second string when it really mattered? They they gave them opportunities throughout the game, but at the end, it was the the big trio. Uh, Nora Merck admitted she was not at one hundred percent fitness in this championship. Uh, she'd had a, a calf or an Achilles problem. She's not too sure, but. Every training session, every game, almost as soon as it was over, she was taking her right shoe off. Um, Henny Rice had a fever, but as we know, half half of all teams had a fever or a cold uh, on the final weekend. Good, well, uh, that throws that whole uh, not giving fans autographs and selfies out the window. <laughs> but yeah, uh, by <laughs> forcing the players to stand out yes, in the cold yeah, for yeah. an hour, they all got the flu. Yeah, well, it kills the prize. But uh, yeah, so. I think it was maybe a lack of lack of depth slash trust and from what I saw in the Norwegian media um, not going 7v6 everyone wants them to have that 7v6 option for when things actually get a bit desperate because for the first time as you guys said the comeback was the comeback happened they needed to do something again to turn it around and uh, 7v6 might have fixed that but uh they don't have they don't have that as part of their plan. You feel like just France had too much for them, and when you look at statistics as well, um, kind of backs up what you're saying there. There, Chris, like eleven different French players scored versus Norway's seven. I think it, French players had thirteen shooters versus Norway's eight, and France's three top scorers scored forty five of the goals, while Norway's top three top three scorers scored uh, almost seventy percent of the goals. So you feel like when you think back to Norway teams of of the past, you'd always look at the bench and the players they could bring on and it felt like it was kind of switched around this time. I feel like France had so much more to offer. And then the gambles they took with someone like with uh, with Lena Grandview, they just paid off on the day as well, which uh, which you needed that bit of luck as well. And uh, you need that bit of special magic to win titles like this. And I think that was that cherry on top of the of the win. Like so much credit to, to Olivier Crumbolds because this has been his approach for this team forever you can see the stats of how many medals he's won with with France over the years now this is his last world championship he said that before though the fact that he's trusted the entire 16 plus players every time has really come to fruition do you know what uh, happened, happened Grass Sadi? I think she just hasn't been at, at the level um, this whole tournament she, she hasn't been played as much um, I think you know Orlan Canor has taken some of her minutes and Zeminko has played mostly uh, centre back, uh, and yeah, I think she's kind of dropped back in the pecking order. Essentially, interesting to see, but obviously it's fine for France. Yeah, I mean she she's played like still you know fifteen to twenty minutes of every game. I met her last night at the pub, and uh, she was very happy with herself. Not a bother <laughs> on her, you know. The only thing she was pissed off about was the fact that they were so terrible at the start of the championship. And it was like, well, you do that all the time, don't you? It's like, I know, but I don't like it. Why can't we just be good all the time? So that's a, that's a, that's a good sign for, for Paris. Yeah, I, w- I will just want to wax lyrical on uh, France's defense a little bit because I think that was the, the difference. And you mentioned, Chris, that they were so aggressive and even... But it was so tactically aggressive. And uh, I actually, it was an interview that uh, Sasha Stadt did on behalf of uh, Strex Biller. Uh, he talked to Henny Reistad and Stine Oftedal. And both of them mentioned that uh, France's defense really threw them off their rhythm by going really aggressive and then dropping back. So at, remember at the start of the second half, they. France just pulled out a 3-2-1 defense out of nowhere. And because they knew that this is the time that Henny Rice had is going to, she, you know, she's rested up, she's ready to just start her big, like, avalanche of goals. And they're like, no, no matter what, you're not scoring here. You're not getting into rhythm. And then uh, five minutes later, they completely drop back to 6-0. And they would continue to kind of go aggressive, then drop back. And in that way, just completely ruining Norway's momentum because they, you know, when you're attacking, you, you're like, okay, they're stepping up on us, so let's do this. And then you go up the other side of the court and 
it's a completely different situation. So you have to change your mind, change your tactics continually. Um, and that was brilliantly done. And definitely, as you said, Oliver uh, Krumholtz did his homework to to know when to do that. Um, it was it was really impressive. And Paletta Foppa was an absolute beast. She she shut down Henny Reisland. Henny Reisland is human again. Uh, we have to also say we, I think, kind of figured together that we saw the best of France against Norway the first time around. That was wrong. Yeah, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it was literally quite the opposite of what we said. It was like we we probably said the best at Norway, and like uh, France had another gear in them. It is a joy to see France kind of, you know, push on like this in a way. Um, and it that I think will also help to bring the best out of Norway in the in the coming months. And I don't know if you guys saw this that uh, France and Norway. Will uh, as they've done many times in the build-up to the Olympics, will train together in the south of France. So the two best teams in the world are going to have training camp together to prepare to beat the shit out of everyone else. That's so strange. <laughs> You're right, but I mean they've been doing it uh, ever since uh, Marit Breivik's time, so the former Norway coach, and they've been training with other big teams in the build-up to the Olympics. I think at one point they did it with Russia when Trefilov was the coach with France it's kind of scary for everyone else yeah it is they're just gonna yeah interesting very interesting and uh, I don't know if there's anything anything else you want to throw at this game do you get worried about Norway a little bit it, it seemed like again we, we mentioned they just have the three backcourt players who are incredible Henny Rice is the best player in the world see after that does what she does. Nora Merck has dropped. He said she's injured, so maybe that's the difference. But um, what was it? She only scored one goal in the final weekend from open play. I uh, just scored a lot of penalties, though. And that was also a key moment. Sorry, just dropping back to it. When, for some reason, Nora Merck had scored seven from seven penalties and Henny Reistad stepped up to take the eighth penalty that... Um, Norway earned uh, in a crucial moment I think it was two goals in it and that was saved that was a really strange decision I think overall uh, like near future for the Olympics I don't think they'd be too worried about it if anything it'll be a good reminder that they need to come up with some new tricks and uh, as we've discussed already this month uh, we we have to accept that teams and players can get better as well (laughs) but uh, I spoke to Daniel Hoagland and the the via play gang from Norway and they are a little worried about what's going to happen right after the Olympics and kind of you know medium term stuff for Norway because Stina Oftedal this is her last world championship she's just had uh, unless she deceives us all and then we'll get the Sheaposh award whenever she makes her comeback Um, and there is that kind of generation of players that are uh, at the end of the Olympic cycle maybe thinking about calling it a day so uh, Henny Rice that will have to pick up even more slack uh, but yeah that could also be good for them I think it's happened to Norway before they've managed to find uh, find solutions they managed to, to turn things around so I think one one final loss uh, in three years is uh, is okay do you think that maybe this Herger Eisen will finish up after the Olympics maybe they I think uh, that the current assistant is likely to take over as he took over from Breivik. So, uh, uh, yeah, probably more of the same after that. Yeah, he'd be looking at this. And I think it's clear from a lot of youth handball as well that they don't, they don't have the same calibre of players coming through the, the youth teams as well. So he might be looking at this thinking, look, I've done my job here. Future isn't looking quite as bright as it used to, and I'll I'll move on to other things. Maybe some club handball for him. Well, they, they need that Olympic gold. That's the key thing. I think if they manage to do that, then... A lot of them will uh, head off into the sunset very happy. Yeah, I I, I do worry. I do worry um, about this Norway team. It's just the the caliber of players in that secondary unit is kind of nowhere near the the three that they have. And the way they've played also is just, you know, fully reliant on those three players for everything. And they're just so great together but even taking one unit out of that could be detrimental 
that being Oftedal or Merck, both who are likely to um, move on. And it's uh, weird to be... Yeah, the, col- to be, the Kolstad conundrum. Yeah. Almost, yeah. <laughs> weird to be talking about <laughs> this after like that, that semi-final performance. Yeah. And uh, oh, Norway are always Norway, but... There's a, I, I get this feeling of maybe Norway will not always stay as Norway. Probably a bit of bias there as well because when they have looked good in the past, they've looked so untouchable for so long and so unplayable. And the fact that they just look slightly more human now, we're probably exaggerating a little bit because, I mean, they were within one goal of France for... I think it had things gone a different way. I had one of their goalkeepers came up and to, like saved five of those shots and later in the game, we could, have had a, we could have had a completely different game. And they've had situations like that before where the where goalkeepers have pulled them out of difficult situations, but they didn't really have it in the final. So it's just something as small as that when the Olympics roll around, could see them on the other on on top of the podium. Bronze medal for Denmark as well. We have to give them some credit. They bounced back really well in one of the sweatiest games of handball I've ever seen. What a slog that was. Perfect bronze medal action, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm I'm really impressed with them because again, to come back from such heartbreak, such devastation. Can we saw it in the bronze medal match they played uh, three years ago? They they were probably the better team, but they just couldn't come back from such devastation. And uh, in this case, they gathered themselves. They didn't have an easy game, uh, and they won. It was still a really good feeling in this Denmark team to come out with a medal at their home championship. They were able to celebrate, and I do feel happy that they they got that they deserved it and uh, also good news there that uh, Katharina Heindel's injury is not as bad as first feared she's I think it's like a medial ligament so she'll be out for a few months but should hopefully be back for the Olympics as well which is kind of you know, the, the huge not kind of it is the big thing now for everyone in the months to come but yeah let's go on to the awards do we agree on the, the breakout player award then yeah yeah, yeah I think that's fair Actually, did anyone have it's any other done. nominations? I, I don't think there's anything that rivals. The, uh, Viola Leuchter player. won the best young player. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And officially in the IHF All-Star team. But uh, I had I had a bit of a short list and I can just say what they were just as I was creating because I thought you might say Elaine as well. Um, I, may, cause I didn't really see these as proper breakout performances because I feel like because we know... Oh, well, I had... Uh, Bo van Vetering from the from the Dutch. I mean, she's not. A, it's not really a breakout, though, is it? But she was eighty one percent from shooting, so 30, 38 goals from forty seven shots. So she was quite uh, quite good from from the wing for the Dutch. Uh, House here as well. You know, I mean, a fairly new name, but was also really impressive in some games. I, I agree with House here because she broke out. She was always, she's been a top player for a while, but she broke out into potentially the Netherlands best player in this tournament and she has a move to Dior lined up uh, for next season so she's ready to break out at the highest level there's a lot of Dutch and Danish players now going to Dior are they the new France and uh, Norway are we seeing the next pair of dominant Could teams be. on the way in, well it's one for another day but uh, yeah uh, the Dutch team they they definitely uh, they definitely got the short <laughs> end of this draw. They're probably yeah probably the third or fourth best team in this tournament, and just uh, unfortunately came up against Norway in the quarterfinal. So congratulations to Lena Granve, our breakout star. Yeah, sorry, I one one name here is definitely not a breakout award, but I didn't know where to put her. Um, but I have her here under the breakout of the names that I had, uh, Diana. Mogosa from Montenegro who he was 28 years old so it's definitely not a breakout performance but I think nobody was talking about her name at all before the tournament but she finished I mean uh, probably you have some praises to go to Popovich there for being able to put her in assist to play at this level but 34 goals 7 tops joint 7 top scorer of the tournament so they needed someone like that to come up with the goods and I think uh, she probably gave Montenegro uh, a huge boost with her, with her performance, but maybe not a breakout, but maybe there's a different award somewhere else. Yeah, surprise! It, it, it is weird, or... kind of. You know, th- there's probably players who broke out. Another one is Ch- Chavalova for Czech Republic, a 21 year old who kind of broke out, scored 41 goals, was really impressive. 
came from nowhere. Scored lots more goals than Lena Granvo, but you just can't compare that to the in to a the final. final <laughs> yeah, the final. Is, yeah, do it in the final. Cholovova, I had her for two games, their last two games, and she did diddly squat. So I was waiting for something there, and unfortunately, it just didn't happen for her. I mean, you look at a player like like Bakarut, who had a very good tournament all the way up to the final, and then in the final, then was just hooked. Then when she was looking a bit, looking a bit she, shaky, she dropped and the that ball just could... once and didn't yeah. come yeah. back nope. into the game. It's like, <laughs> oh, so you go. Yeah. Only Nora Murray may drop the ball. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we'll go through the other awards. Then uh, we have the uh, Swiss Army Knife, we have the Swiss Cheese Award, the Butter Knife, the Random Rocket, Catch Me If You Can. And the Adrian Sheepush Award for Excellence in Shithousery and perhaps a surprise addition to the lineup later on from Brian. So the Swiss Army Knife. Alex, give us the uh, introduction to that and your nomination. As always, Swiss Army Knife is a player who can just do so much on a court. Doesn't have to be the absolutely best player. Um in the world, but uh, a player who contributes defensively in attack do- does a lot more than uh, what their role in the team might entail. Uh, and for me, I do have a pretty good Swiss Army knife, as in a very imp- impressive player nominated, but I think it was uh, Stel Enzeminko for me because of her defensive ability and transition ability so she had three steals in the final um time and time again she is so dynamic in that defensive role that it causes so much havoc for opposing teams and she was just really good in attack um for france but not you know she's not the top scorer every game she'll she'll score four goals get three or four assists which is very consistent uh, defensively and in attack. I think we've had this conversation a few times now, but I always feel like she's too good for that award. <laughs> I think we've said this before. And I feel like you're not going to cook a gourmet dinner with a Swiss Army knife. And I feel like you cook a gourmet dinner with the tools that she offers. Uh, so for me, she was a little bit too good for that award. So I went for someone a little bit, another French player, uh, Tamara Horacek. Um, um, she obviously offers, offers a lot to the French team defensively. Um, but then come up with five goals in the final scored nine against Sweden um, it's fairly decent 50% from nine metre shooting which actually surprisingly puts her fairly high up on the nine metre shooting over the whole tournament and did a bit of a job on Steen Oftedal in the final as well uh, so it caused a bit of chaos there so she would be my kind of Swiss Army knife I do, I do like her because she is she kind of typifies a player that you would throw in any position she'd do a job for you like I said you, you, if she needs to go out and score some goals take the penalties in every, any position she'll do it but also if she just needs to go out there and ruin somebody else's game I'm pretty sure she's glad to do that as well um, the one I went for uh, I like the suggestion that Tim gave us on the discord Zania Smiths and I thought yeah that that strikes a chord with me and looking at her stats as well, it's like th- both the positive and the negative stats kind of speak to that. She had uh, 12 steals in the championship, 25 goals at 66%, which is for a backcourt player, very strong, 34 assists, also seven suspensions and the most penalties conceded in the championship with nine. So she really was all around for a better or for worse uh, for this German team. What I like about her is that she has had kind of a re-emergence because only a few years ago, uh, it seemed like she was going to be destined to be a defensive player. She was this big shooter once upon a time. Then her shoulder completely stopped working, uh, had to reinvent herself as a defensive player. Now her shoulder works again, and uh, she's able to do uh, a little bit of both. And yeah, also for that German team, playing all around the court. I do think that around the Swiss Army Life conversation, it feels like the France team was just a team of Swiss Army Knights. <laughs> yeah. Like you could probably, Paletta Foppa is probably another good example. He could do everything, does so much. They, it just worked. And the way that they're uh, used as well, again, they, they share time so much that, you know, they're just switch. Krumholtz is just switching between the different blades he has <laughs> on, on his knife. Um, and that really worked. 
Tricky this one now. I don't know who to go for. If we're if we're saying here that it has it has to be a French player because of the <laughs> then I'm gonna lean I'm gonna lean towards Horacek because yeah, Enzimiko is just too good. I think that's a decent enough. If I think of if I think of Enzimiko, I think of her like her top level like breakthrough goals and like her being a superstar. Horacek is like yeah, put her anywhere and she'll. Yeah, and and think the, she is the Christian O'Sullivan of the team, and that's what a goal goes back to at the beginning. <laughs> All right, yeah, Tamara Horacek, lovely, and uh, that's two for France so far. Let's see, let's see what's next. The Swiss. We might have a bit of recency uh, bias here. I think, uh, the, <laughs> for this award, the, these awards. The Swiss cheese. We have a couple of uh, nominees for this one. The so Swiss cheese is uh, generally some bad defensive performances uh, can be a player can be a team can be uh, whatever you can imagine uh, so what what do you have Chris I have the Croatian defense and this may not seem like an obvious one because they don't concede an awful lot of goals but I think the the stats kind of tell a lie here or some stats kind of dig deeper into this and there's been periods in this championship because I covered all six of Croatia's games where the defense was just so annoyingly fragile and Swiss cheese-like that I couldn't believe it. It all started in the very first game where they only conceded 22 goals against Senegal but were literally torn to shreds by the Senegalese uh, attack who were just like dancing around them and just like making them look like fools. Uh Again, against Sweden, when they looked like they were going to give a good game of it, they were just ripped apart. And the Hungary game, the one which saw them uh, like walking through the quarterfinals down to not even getting an Olympic qualification tournament place. The attack had a big part to do with that, but also the defence being ripped apart by Hungary's second team. Uh, And the fact that made me think more about it was that the keepers really saved their asses on so many occasions. Keepers had the highest, the second highest saving percentage of the championship, 37.8 for the whole championship, uh, which tells a story of great goalkeeping, but terrible defense that they had to be such goal keep, good goalkeepers to finish like somewhere between 13th and 16th place. <laughs> so yeah, that's my one. Yeah, that's good. If this is a different podcast, we come on here and we just say it's Greenland, you know, but it's not, not our style of podcast, <laughs> you know. It's not our style. We could, we could put all the facts out there and say that the Greenland only saved 45 goals and, and there was 30, 263 goals received from oh. them. But we're not going to do that. But I have one, a bit of a weird one, okay? Could say that, but we're not. We're not going to say that. <laughs> Jesper Jensen's brain. Okay? So... <laughs> Right for one minute. I see where this is going. Of a game. Yeah. Okay. Jesper Jensen's brain for the last minute of the tie against Norway. How he didn't want to go woman on woman marking for Henny Rystad when the whole world knew that she was going to get the ball, and in the game she was having, how you wouldn't try to take her out for that one minute. So that that just for that very very small micro situation, I want to nominate Jesper Jensen's brain. What really like backs this up for me, Brian, is that he is her club coach. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sees her play every single day for the last two and a half years <laughs> and doesn't think well I don't know but it did I mean he didn't have her like marked woman on woman but they did have two defenders on her she just happened to float sideways past them both I would even probably extend that as in you talk about the last minute but maybe they should have just gone for it uh, a little bit earlier <laughs> when Rice had scored her 12th goal <laughs> or you know her eleventh goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she think they're a bit. Uh, she's surely not going to score another one now. That's 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 wild. Oh, she's oh, there's another one got in. Oh, she's really good, isn't she? <laughs> Just kind of watching her. Uh, 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 I, fair I, enough. I like that. Yeah, I like maybe Jesper <laughs> Essen's brain. So it's cheese award. <laughs> oh, God, poor Jesper. Uh, the butter knife. Butter knife is a player who does one thing very very well and uh, they're used or they have ended up being that kind of player where they can do one particular move score one particular goal do one particular job for a team brilliantly I mentioned this player last year 
And I'm putting it out there again. Nora Merck. 18 of her 26 goals from penalties. One goal from open play in the final weekend, as we mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's enough for me. Injured or not. The thing is, and coming into this championship, she, this was not the form she was in. So maybe the, the injury has something to do with this because I heard a stat that if you take away penalties, she's still the fourth top scorer in the Danish league this season. So she has been scoring from open play. She has been doing the job. But for whatever reason, injury or not, she did not have any interest in doing that for Norway at this championship. It was all about the penalties. So I, I did have Nero Merck as one of my options. And I think I... I think I nominated her last year yeah. uh, for the same. Yeah, um, we we had this, reason. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I think it was uh, it wasn't as evident as this year, especially in that final, uh, where she was actually quite bad at everything else in that final, being harsh here. Uh, this is a player who's won the award before, so I don't know if this is uh, yeah. we can do this. But Lena Haugstad, again, being the prototype butter knife as a player who is a defender and a transition player and she doesn't get any sniff of the attack even though she is a great shooter and in transition she was really really good for Denmark but I think we did give it to her a couple of years ago uh, but I, I don't think that's, that takes her out of the equation for it uh, because she's also like since breaking out as that player two years ago has like inspired a generation of Nordic teams doing the same thing. So Sweden have Christine Thorleifstadt here, who plays in the center of defense and barrels as as fast as possible to try and break through and score from long range. And uh, the same with Norway, uh, usually Bakkerud, who sometimes gets a bit of time in attack. But yeah, she's inspired a new position. I mean, what more do you want? <laughs> That's a... But Nora's won this before, hasn't she? I think she got it. I think she got it last year. And two yeah, years I think ago, so. did she get it? I think, or, or did it, I think we felt pretty go against it. And I think both of us were pretty much in agreement about this. Yeah. Last year. Oh, okay. And, I, then I think we then we'll go. We'll, and two years ago, as Howe said, so it's the battle of the champions, it seems. So I've got a another one. Oh. It's, a, it's a bit of a wild card. If uh, and this is Trina Lunda. She only saves. <laughs> no, her her butter knife. But the reason why she's a butter knife is because she just wins finals for Norway at this stage of her career. Mm. You know, in this tournament, Celia Salberg was the clear number one goalkeeper. She was the the player for Norway throughout the competition. Lunda played some games, but not not the key ones, and wasn't necessarily at the best level and then I know you probably disagree with this but she did have that run in the second half she had a she, got she, had a th she won the goalkeeper battle the, like she won the, the goalkeeper yeah, she, she Norway had, had more saves yeah she had 30% <laughs> she had 30% which is still good but it was that spell in the second half that always spurs the Norway comeback yeah. and it's Katrina Lunda who makes she made 8 saves from 17 shots in a spell then didn't make any other ones so she did her job of getting Norway back into it, and then it was uh, the outfield players that didn't didn't respond. So her role, and we've seen it many times again, where she comes into tournaments at a late stage and just wins medals for Norway. That's my my other so wild card choice. I, I have three choices, Brian. Which one do you go for? Oh God. Um... I think let's go for I think it's harsh to give it maybe to the keeper because uh, they do have a quite limited role generally but I think let's go for Lena Haugstedt then Lena Haugstedt inspiring a generation yeah yes. I think she deserves it lovely uh, what do we got next Alex next up we have the random rocket um, generally a player yeah. who just comes up with a random shot um, from nowhere and it goes in that it can also be kind of random moments when uh, this player becomes the focal point and goes through a hot streak um, I I did have a random not rocket nomination and that was Mia Hoyland for Denmark 
was my random rocket. Because Mia ha- Hoyland is a player who, like, she didn't have the best tournament. I, I think she was pretty much the fourth best player for for backcourt player for Denmark when we a while ago thought that she was she had the potential to be their superstar but she did come up with really really important goals at important times including that um spell in extra time for Denmark where they were struggling and Mia Hoyland came in after being terrible the whole game one from six I think uh, and got two goals so she did win the game against uh, Sweden as well at the end with uh, a couple of goals yeah she's a good one and she's become I think like even though she may be the fourth best player she is like the starting playmaker every time like she's given she is, she's yeah. given that role and then Jorgensen and Hansen have to duke it out for uh, the left back position but it feels like it's a bit random when she contributes throughout the game while well, she is the starting playmaker it's a bit random she might just be really good at the start for a couple of goals, then be really quiet, have a purple patch somewhere. Um, so, do you have one, Brian? Uh, I didn't have one okay. for this now. Uh, yeah. My one for this is Dongu Kamara from Senegal, who left me so buzzed at the start of the championship. Anyone who listened to one of our early in championship podcasts would have heard me fall in love with Dongu Kamara, playing with both hands, uh, dishing out the assists, and single-handedly driving Senegal to a draw against Croatia with 10 goals from their 22, all from open play, six of them from the backcourt. She scored seven more goals for the rest of the championship. (laughs) Every single game, I was like, okay, Let's go, Dongu. Another one like against Croatia. And um, yeah, she just didn't seem to have it in her anymore. And it was like she scored one or two goals in every other game. And it was a moment of magic like that, like a rocket from the from the backcourt, like pinging into the top corner and then nothing for the whole thing. Um, yeah, so that's that for me was uh as random as it could possibly be. One amazing performance, 10 from 12, and then not much else. Yeah, that sounds that sounds perfect to me. I think we'll go yeah. with that, will we? I think so. That's a great one. Thank you, Dongu Kamara, and congratulations. <laughs> Next one, the Catch Me If You Can. Uh, we couldn't quite remember what this one is about. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we have some nominations. Uh, I think we kind of made it, I, I, we made it for Luke Steins last time. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because he just uh, couldn't be caught. He's just too fast, dodging around people, dancing around people. And uh, we do have some nominations, despite not exactly knowing what it's about. For for me, the Catch Me If You Can award could only go to one team, and I have specified a player. And that's the Japanese national women's handball team, who were the most elusive nuts style of handball that I've ever seen but it made so much sense you know <laughs> like the, they were just such a joy to watch um, their off the ball movement could literally not be caught um, time, time and time again and uh, the one player that really is in keeping with the original Luke Stein's uh, award is uh, Nat- Natsuki Aizawa who was a uh, Japan's punitive playmaker. Uh, I, I don't know her height. I should probably look that up, but uh, she's very small, but so so elusive. And um, you know, in in that first game against Germany, she almost got the uh, elusive double double, ten goals, nine assists, and kind of continued uh, throughout the competition, being uh, elusive, fun, and exciting. Natsuki Aizawa, yeah. She's yeah. 160 tall. I think that's probably yeah. pretty fair. I think you had Camilla Aram, didn't uh, you? Camilla Aram, I guess this is a yeah, uh, kind of honourable mention. I think uh, Natsuki Aizawa is the winner of this one. But Camilla Aram, 37 years of age, still going strong. Uh, 22 of her 42 goals in the championship on fast breaks. It's still like a sight to behold the way she, she does it. Uh, she's not necessarily the fastest, but... She's away before anyone even thinks about this as a counter-attack. And that's, yeah, when she's one step ahead of everyone like that, 
hard to, to catch them. But I like it. Goes to Japan's Natsuki Aizawa. So, Brian, we got a big one uh, coming up. Do you want to give your surprise one before or after that? My surprise one is not, it's nothing too too crazy, but like I was doing these awards and I kind of felt like they're all quite middle of the road or sometimes a bit negative or totally random. And we don't have an award for a, just a good player or an excellent performance. And I feel like we need to add that in to round off the randomness and to round off the Swiss cheese type style of awards. And if it's going to be a good award, I think it has to be a really good award. So I think we want an award for performances that will be remembered for many years to come. And I think we should call it, these are all like household items kind of thing. We call this the golden key, the golden key to the house. And I think you know who this is going to go to. This is going to go to, to Henny Rice, that's the performance in the, in the semi-final. Uh, against against Denmark, are you on board with this or not, or yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I, I like that. The best, so it's basically the best individual performance in any game from. Any yeah, player. I think, but I think it should be a really special one, one that you will like. It's a really like, not just the best performance of the tournament. You don't always have to give it out, but one which you think this is one that people are going to remember for mm. for many years to come. Back in the day when the Olympics had the arts competitions, they didn't always give medals to every... Uh, they didn't always give a gold medal or a silver medal. It just wasn't awarded. So in future championships, we may not award the golden key. But Hen yes. Henny Reista is setting the tone here or is setting the bar with a performance like that. Yeah, I like I it. I think so. Yeah. Very good. Cool. All right. It's, it's a pretty high bar because... It's a pretty I high bar. <laughs> the, the best performance from a player I've ever seen... Yeah on the men's side or the women's side so but it, um, it doesn't, doesn't need to be award. that high every time to be that, that was that was yeah. yeah i guess like Platinum key. another another qualifier would be like uh gisley christiansen in the final of the champions league like memorable exactly, in that, yeah. sense. So that kind of yeah yeah all right i like it yeah henny rice had deserved some some award here <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> i mean she's i was thinking like should we talk about the best player of the year at some point for the women it's like that's no point in doing that what's, anymore what's the point yeah <laughs> it's just it's done <laughs> yeah also gets the unofficial player of the year. Um, now, time for the Adrian Shipwash Award for Excellence in Shithousery. Uh, this one I kind of struggled with to really, to, to come up with a, like an individual. I think the, the past winners have, have made this difficult. Um, so the one I've gone for is uh, Norway's goalkeeping department because they have been a bunch of shithousers. You remember the beginning? You remember before the championship <laughs> when Silvia Solberg wasn't going to play and uh, Katrina Lunda was not going to play, and we were, had two unknown players uh, who were merely playing for one of the top Champions League teams <laughs> in the land, and Marie Davidson, who ended up sitting on the sideline for the whole thing. She wasn't even in Denmark. She didn't even get a ticket to the final weekend. <laughs> uh, they completely fooled us. A whole bunch of shithousery. One of the big topics before the championship. I mean, Solberg is incredible. She didn't play a game of club handball this season. She had she she gave birth. She wasn't playing for Jur. She was like out of the championship. And then in the pre-championship tournament, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, she, she feels all right. Maybe she'll go in there. And uh, as you said earlier was the consistent performer for Norway at this championship. And then Katrina Lunda only shows up for the final weekend now, as you said, and just like comes up with performances. If they had won gold, uh, it would have been like stamped like Norway's goalkeeping department. The fact they didn't win it in the end kind of takes a little bit of sheen off, but uh, I think that's some excellent shithousery. I have three different nominations, okay? So you can pick whichever ones you want from us. Li Gong of China, the only player in the whole tournament to get two red cards so I quite like it just as a base it's just as a starting point you know just to get just to uh, get us going Adriana Popovic of um, Montenegro 11 two minute suspensions in the tournament which is strong the most of any player and then France's medical team oh we're all so <laughs> sick oh <laughs> we're all so sick we can't play and then they come out and do that and they just storm the whole tournament oh. it's like you can't have been that Take bad. it easy on us, Sweden. <laughs> Not that easy. Yeah. 
uh, I, I really so they're like, my three nominations. I, I really like France's medical department. In keeping with your comment, Chris, that it was uh, if Norway had won gold, that it would be Norway's goalkeepers. But since France won gold while being terribly ill, uh, <laughs> I, I think that's a that's a really good one. Um, I, I had Celia Smiths. I, I think you mentioned she had, she had seven, uh, two minute suspensions, but always kind of stayed within the limits. Never really took anyone's head off. So it's as a player, she had the most steals in the competition, um, with uh, twelve in total, so one point three per match. But she also had a lot of punishments, so she took a lot of risks. Um, and it worked out a lot of the time, uh, so that that's my nomination. But I really like France, uh, French medical team. When talking about that on on Friday, in the arena to people, there was a fair bit of like, "I'll believe it when I see it." Going on, <laughs> and so and, so, and I mean the pictures look pretty convincing. You know, there was some pictures of players looking pretty dead with like masks on, on the sideline. And, and they to did. be fair, yeah, Laura Philippe really did completely. Um, she started the final and just couldn't go on. She yeah. was essentially um, incapacitated. Uh, so there's some truth to it, but maybe not the the wild truth. They they all seemed pretty fine at the pub yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> the inside information we all needed to confirm this award. <laughs> All right, should we go with France then? Yeah, France uh, have taken a um, not a clean sweep, but they've uh, yeah they've smashed the awards this time. And ah, it's uh, been a good tournament for been them. A good tournament, anyway. it really has. Okay, good stuff. Congratulations to France's medical team and uh, all the other award winners. Thank you all for listening. It's been quite the championship, and it's been fun uh, bringing you extra coverage of it as we uh, close or we come to a close of our first year of having. Uh, Patreon as well, which has helped us, uh, helped inspire us to do a lot more over the championship as well. And uh, long may continue also into next month with the Euro. But until then, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Brian. Goodbye. <laughs>